What's going on guys? Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Amigos Code. In this video, we're going to carry on our microservice series. And more specific, I'm going to teach you everything you need to know about service discovery. So in the previous video, you saw that we had a couple of microservices and they were communicating to each other via HTTP. Now, the information about ports and the IP address where they live, it's something that you shouldn't really manage within your own microservices. So i.e. keeping the list of all the ports and services. So you should never do that because as, as you can imagine, um, your application might, um, you know, scale and, you know, keeping that information can be really difficult. And instead you should use service discovery. In this video, I'm going to teach you Eureka service discovery. And then later in the course, you'll see uh, that when we deploy the application to Kubernetes, we get that for free. So before we kick off, just take two seconds and smash that like button, comment down below. Also, if you're not part of the Amigos Code community, go ahead and join both Discord and Facebook group where you can ask us questions. And uh, yeah, without further ado, let's kick off this video. So far, you've seen that customer talks to Fluid Microservice on port 8081 via HTTP. Now in here, we only have one instance of customer and one instance of fraud. But what about if fraud gets too busy and we have to bring up a second instance? Now you can see that customer can talk to fraud via this port 8081, but also via this port which is 8085. Now, in order for this to be possible, customer would need to know all the existing ports for fraud. Now, you can see that this is a problem. If fraud scales to, let's say, 10 instances, then customer needs to know about all of those 10 instances, i.e. all of their ports and where they are running. And this is when service registry comes to rescue. And in this course, we're going to kick off with Eureka service discovery. But later, as we move to Kubernetes, you will see that we won't need Eureka server at all, but still good practice for you to fully understand how it works. So service discovery is the process of automatically detecting devices and services on a network. So on this side, we have our microservices. So because we are using Eureka, we're going to refer as the Eureka clients. And then we also have the server itself. Now the server, this is where the clients will register themselves. So when they register, the server will know the exact information where the service is running, i.e. the host as well as the port. Then the microservices as well, whenever they need to talk to another microservice, they will basically look up to this server as well. And this is how they can connect with each other. So the server knows all the client applications running on each port and IP address. And now let me demonstrate to you how it works if we were to have two instances of fraud. So before I said that customer would need to know all the ports for fraud, i.e. AT. 81 as well as 8082 or 8085, right? Now, customer, the first thing that it does, it registers itself as a client to the Eureka server. The same with fraud. So this instance of fraud as well as this instance of fraud. So now this server right here has information about the IP addresses as well as the ports for all microservices. Then if customer wants to talk to fraud, let's say through HTTP, the first thing that it does, it sends a service discovery request, i.e. where does fraud lives. Then the server in here will return the address for one of these services, i.e. this one right here, or this one running on port 8082. And then off it goes the request to, for example, let's say this instance of fraud. So this is how it works. Now you can see that in here we have a bottleneck. So 
this Eureka server, if for whatever reason it goes down, so if this goes down, then you can see that how all of these microservices are meant to talk to each other. So this is why it's very important that we do our best to keep this server up and running at all costs. But later, as you'll see when we move to Kubernetes, we will need to use this Eureka server, which will be one less pet for us to worry about. Next, let's go ahead and install the Spring Cloud dependency in order for us to set all of this up. Within Spring.io, navigate to Projects and then select Spring Cloud in here. And basically, Spring Cloud provides tools for developers to quickly build some of the common patterns in distributed systems. For example, configuration management, service discovery, circuit breakers, routing, micro proxy, control bus, one time tokens, so on and so forth. So, on the left hand side, you can see what they have to offer. So a bunch of things, so including Kubernetes, GCP, um, Cloud Functions, OpenFay, Security, Sleuth, which you'll see in a second, Vault for secrets management. And right here, you can also read more about, you know, what they have to offer. But basically, and also load balancing, which I'll show you how to use this in a second. So in order for us to take advantage of these features, we have to install Spring Cloud. Now, in this page, if I scroll down, you can see that this is how we install it. So we just include it in our dependency management and we refer to the version and then type POM, scope import and then job done. Now, if I also scroll down in here, so what I want to show you is, so let's see if they have the current version. So actually, I think it was right in here. Yes. So right in here. So as I speak, this is the current version right here. So the release train. So you can see that this Dalston was for uh, the boot version 1.5. And then as it went all the way to 2.4, this is the version that you should be using. So 2. Point, so 2020.0. Dot and then X in here. And then AKA Ilford. So you can click on, on this link and you'll see where it takes you. But basically, you can see that here are all the releases. So currently, it's at 2020.0.3. And you can read more about these release notes in here. But as I speak, I'm going to install 2020.0.3. And for you to follow along so that everything works without no issues, please do install this exact same version. So if I go back in here and right here, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to basically take this dependency in here, control C, and then let's open up IntelliJ and within it, open up the main POM. And what we're going to do is, so if I put this full screen right here, so within the dependency management, we already have the Spring Boot dependencies, but let's also have this one right here for Spring Cloud. Now, this is so that we can let all these sub modules pick whatever dependencies that they want, the same way that we've done with this Spring Boot dependencies. Now, obviously, we need to have this version in here. So control C. And then in here, I'm going to basically have this version like so. And the version I said was 20.0. 20.0.3. Now go ahead and reload so that it picks up the changes. And there you go. So now that we have Spring Cloud installed, next let's go ahead and get up and running with service discovery. Okie dokie. Now that we have Spring Cloud, Let's together build the service which will be responsible for our for our service discovery. And then we'll have both customer and fraud connect to it so that we can take advantage of service discovery and not worry about ports. So in here, let's go ahead and create a new module. And I'm going to name this as so basically leave everything as is. This is a Maven project. Click on next. And this will be Eureka 
dash and then server. And now if I open up the main pom.xml in here, if I scroll up, you should see that we have the Eureka server module. And right here we have Eureka and then server. So here, what we're going to do is let's just open the pom.xml and within dependencies. So let's just have the dependencies block. And in here, what we need is a dependency that comes from spring and then cloud. And the artifact is spring dash and then cloud dash starter and then Netflix. And then we have the Eureka and then server. And then this comes from org.springframework.cloud. There we go. If I put this full screen, I just want to show you what we have in here. Have a look. So this is the dependency that we have. And you can see that it comes from, if I click on this button, you can see that basically it's from Spring Cloud Netflix dependencies. And this is this dependency that we've just added right here. So this one is part of this. So now that we have the dependency, let's together open up the Java folder, create a new package. This will be com.amigos code dot and then Eureka server. And inside, let's just have the Eureka server application class. And let's annotate this with at spring boot application. Also inside, let's have our main method and then inside say spring application dot run Eureka server application dot class and then pass the arguments. So you've seen all of this. Now for this class in here, we need to basically tell that this will be the Eureka server. So just annotate this with at and then enable Eureka and then server. And right here, this is not picking up because I need to reload. So remember, we added a dependency, but we haven't reloaded the Maven changes. So this should work now. And there we go. So now you can see that I can import the class and job done. So one more thing that we have to do is to add the application.yaml. So file application.yaml. And in here, I want to basically have the uh, server port, so server and then port, and this will run on 87 and then 61. We also want to define that. Uh, so there's a, a property called fetch registry. This will be equals to false. And then also in here, we need to say register with Eureka. So register with Eureka. So this will be false because this is our server in here. But you'll see that the clients will need basically fetch registry right here, which indicates whether this client should fetch the registry information from the Eureka server. No, this is the server itself. And then we have register with Eureka indicates whether or not the instance should register its information with the server. Again, no, right? So the server, this is where the clients will, will register to it so that it can be discoverable by others. And one last thing that I forgot is to add the application name. So application name, and this will be Eureka dash and then server. And I usually like to put this at the very beginning, just like that. And there we go. So now let's open up the Eureka server application. Let's run this. And currently both fraud and customer are not running, but we'll get them up and running in a second. So I just want to make sure that this works. There we go. You can see that it's working. And right here, Tomcat started on port 8761 in here. So also, um, you can go and add the banner.txt if you don't want this default in here. So let me just collapse this in here and create the banner.txt. And then paste this. So I already had in my buffer and you can go and generate this from the website I gave you before. So if I reload once more, we should see now our banner 
and our Eureka server is pretty much ready to go. All right, so Tomcat started on port 8761. So let's go ahead and open up our web browser. And in here, I'm going to basically navigate to localhost and then 8761. So this is where the server is up and running and then just press enter. Now, have a look. So this is this uh, web page right here, which uh, says Spring Eureka. And it kind of gives me information about the server itself. So basically there's nothing about the environment and, it's, and this is because it hasn't been configured. But here you can see current uptime, uh, renewals, the replicas, and more importantly, instances currently registered with Eureka, which are none. So no instances are connected. So this is the server itself. And we haven't told our microservices to connect to this Eureka server. So we haven't done that yet. And we're going to do that in a second. But also what I want to show you is there's uh, basically some information that you can see the total available memory, CPUs, the current memory usage, and then the instance information right here. And the status is up. So this is running on local host. But basically this page doesn't give you much information. But as we start registering the clients, i.e. our microservices to this Eureka server, we should see this section right here being updated, as well as the number of instances that we have registered per each microservice. Next, let's go ahead and configure our microservices to point to this Eureka server. So in here, I'm going to leave the Eureka server up and running. And let's start with the customer microservice. So pretty much open up customer main POM in here. So POM.xml. And inside, what we're going to do is remember for our Eureka server, we added the Eureka server dependency. So let me just show you once more. So in here, so inside of this pom.xml have a look we have spring cloud starter netflix eureka server so we kind of need the exact same thing in here so copy that and then go to customer and in here i'm going to paste this in but instead of the server what we need is so in here if i press control space we have the client and this again is from spring cloud so now we're telling that this will be the client that will connect to our server. Now reload in here and then open up customer main. So the main class or the customer application. And let's annotate this with at and then enable Eureka and then client. Now, the other thing that we have to do is open up the application.yaml. So this is how we tell it where to connect to the Eureka server. So in here, we need a couple of things. So right here, after the database configuration, I'm going to say service and then URL. And inside we have the default and then zone. And this will be HTTP colon forward slash forward slash local host colon 87 61 forward slash Eureka. Now what we need is to do the exact same thing for fraud. But before we do that, let's start the custom application just to make sure that everything works. So just give you a second. And in the logs, we should see that in here, have a look. So started application and have a look. We have discovery client, customer, and this is the port right here. So I'll come back to this in a second, but you can see that the application started correctly. Now, if I collapse this and then open up my web browser and in here before, remember we had no instances available. If I reload that, uh, have a look, we have a customer in here. Now the concept is really simple. So we have customer in here 
and basically this is the information on how to get to customer now this name right here application comes from here so make sure that you always name your applications so here if you change this to full in here this will be full in uppercase now obviously if you have more than one instance connected to the server i.e two customer instances you should see that we'll have two instances of customer so if i go back to intellij and in here let me just open up the configuration edit configuration and what i want to do is the following so i'm going to basically duplicate this so duplicate customer application and in here just say um, two and what i want to do is add um, some environments or uh, more correctly a program argument so i'm gonna say dash dash and then server dot and then port equals to and then i'm going to say let's say 8085 so i know nothing is using 8085 so if i apply and okay and now i'm going to run customer application 2 so this is a second instance of customer so run this so you can see that we have one instance here and another one here and this right here already connected to the server but if i go back now if i reload have a look so availability zones we have two so we have two instances of the customer application so this is kind of cool and you can see that it's actually maintaining the address for all the microservices so the first instance is available on 8080 the second instance is available on 8085 now i said that the whole purpose of service discovery is to eliminate the uh, use of the port and information where the uh, server is running and i'm going to show you this in a second how are you going to have microservices talking to each other through service discovery but for now i just wanted to show you that if you have a second instance you'll have uh, basically uh, this number going up in here so obviously we don't need this second instance so let me just uh, stop so i'm going to stop customer 2 and also let me just delete this configuration in here just like that apply and then okay now let's do the same for fraud so i'm just going to take this configuration open up fraud and open up src or in fact let's just have the client so instead of the server we want the client just like that reload in here and then open up the main for fraud fraud application and in here this should be at enable and then eureka client and open up resources application.yaml and let's have the exact same information in here just like that and also if you want you can say fetch so in here you can say uh, fetch registry equals to true and the default is true actually and then here register with eureka and then true so if i show you in here so you can see the default is true for fetch registry and register with eureka as well true but let's just keep these so you know exactly what's happening so in here if i open up a uh, customer and then paste those in there we go and for fraud let's also make sure that we can run fraud so open up the fraud application and then right click run there we go and in here we should see that now we should only have one customer available and we also should have fraud in here so if i reload there we go you can see that we have one customer application or server up and running and also we have one fraud which is running on port 8081 if you have questions getting this far please do let me know otherwise next let me show you how we're going to have customer talking to fraud using service discovery
So if you remember correctly, if I open the customer and then service in here, so before remember that customer makes, so in here, makes a network call right here to fraud by saying localhost 8081. Now I said that the main reason why we use service discovery is to remove this information in here. So localhost and then basically uh, 8081, right? So we let the Eureka server handle this information and all we need to care about is the name of the service that we want to connect to. So in this case is fraud. So just like this. So you can see that we just change this to fraud and job done. It's literally, it's as easy as this. So this right here is, so in this page right here is the application name. So fraud in uppercase, and then this will resolve to this IP address as well as this port. Now let's go back to IntelliJ. And what I want to do is open up the application.yaml and inside of JPA hibernate DDL auto, let's just say create and then drop. So I will, so I'll always want to have a fresh database. So don't do this uh, in production or uh, environments where you want to keep the data, but I just want to have a clean database each time. So here also create and then drop. Now let me restart fraud. There we go. And you can see that we have the database or the create table right here because of create drop. And let's also start customer. So I think customer is already um, up and running. So let's just restart. There we go, the create table and we're good to go. Now let's open up Postman and you've seen this request time and time again. So this request will land in customer and then customer will talk to fraud. If I send this request, we have an internal 500, internal server error. Hmm. Let's have a look why. So in here, so unknown host exception. Now what is happening is, let me actually see if I can demonstrate this to you. So remember I said to you that if I basically uh, click on edit configurations and then fraud, I'm going to duplicate fraud and this will be fraud and then two and inside of program arguments say dash dash and then server dot and then port equals to 8085. So this, uh, there's nothing running on this port. So if I say apply, okay, and then run. There we go. So now in here, if I reload this page, we have two instances of fraud. Now, when we make the HTTP request, currently REST template, REST template is confused. So it doesn't know how to handle this request that goes to fraud, right? So it goes to which of these instances. So it has no clue about it. So this is what's happening. So we're making a HTTP request and from customer, there are two fraud instances. How does REST template knows to send either to this instance or this other instance? Well, to fix this, we need to add an annotation to our REST template to be able to load balance the requests. So if I open up IntelliJ and in here, let's open up customer config and inside, you see that we didn't configure REST template right here, but this bin, we have to also tell it to be at, and then load balanced. So there we go, load balanced, which means that the request can either go to this instance or this other instance. If I open up, so fraud, so where is it? Fraud controller. Have a look. We have fraud check request for customer and then customer ID. 
Now here we have two instances of fraud. So fraud right here and fraud as well. So let me basically delete all the logs and I want to show you that. So here. So before this was a 500 and in fact, let's also restart customer because we added that annotation. So let's reload. There we go. And now if I go back, let's try and send this request and see if it works. So if I send the request, there we go. You can see that this time it works. It's a 200. But what I want to show you is so if I open this fraud application, so let's see whether we have some logs. Yes, have a look fraud request or fraud check request for customer one. And let's have a look at the fraud application two. nothing inside. Now, if I send the request again, so send again and let's check the logs. Check this out. So this time it landed on the fraud application too. So this is quite cool, right? Have a look. So basically it's using round robbing to distribute the requests. So first it landed on this fraud application running on port 8081. And then this other one running on port 8085. If you have any questions on what happened here, please do let me know. Otherwise, let's move on. Okie dokie. I hope that you had fun learning service discovery. And um, yeah, it's an important concept. And hopefully now everything should make sense. If not, just comment down below and let me know what you didn't understand so I can further clarify for you. But as you'll see later in this course, when we start containerizing applications and then deploying into Kubernetes, um, we get service discovery for free and we can get rid of our Eureka service discovery completely, which is one less service to worry about. So as you deploy applications, the less you have to worry about and let other people take care of things that you are not an expert in, the better it is. So as I said, comment down below, Join the Facebook group and uh, I'll catch you in the next one where I'm going to teach you about load balances.